According to the Public Policy Institute of California, California educates more than 6 million children in its K-12 public schools. Many of these children are economically disadvantaged and many, a higher percentage than any other state, are not native speakers. Despite these challenges and despite years of constrained budgets, test scores have been rising. Further improvement is likely to be challenged given the budget situation, the inequitable distribution of school dollars, and the complexity of federal, state, and local funding mechanisms." Unquote. In the second part of our three-part series on K-12 education in California, we'll examine what the California legislature is doing to address the challenges faced by California schools with Assemblymember Julia Brownlee, Democrat from Santa Monica and Chair of the Education Committee, Assemblymember Chris Norby, Republican from Fullerton, Vice Chair of the Education Committee, and Sacramento Bee reporter Kevin Yamamura. The State of K-12 Education. What is the state legislature's education agenda for 2012? From Fresno, the Maddie Report, with Executive Director of the Maddie Institute, Mark Kepler. Education is not a key priority of state government. It may very well be the priority of state government. Indeed, K-14 through education consumes about one half of the state budget. The chair and the vice chair of the Assembly's Education Committee join us today. Welcome to the Maddie Report. We have Assemblymember Julia Brownlee, a Democrat from Santa Monica, who's chair of the committee, and Assemblymember Chris Norby, Norby Republican from Fullerton, who's the vice chair. Yes. Um, well, we've got a, lots of questions to go over, so let's get started. Uh, let's first of all step back and take a broad view of K-12 through education in California. Mm -hmm. What grade would you give it? One grade is, that's a, a little simplistic, but I will say that if you're based on API scores, we have improved tremendously. I think about 60% of our schools have a API over 800, um, but we still have that 40% that we're, we're not doing well in, and um, certainly we need, in my opinion, we need a much larger investment um, in those schools to ensure that we have high quality teachers um, and the right conditions for teaching and learning to um, make sure all children are successful in school, and that's not happening in California. You know, it might be yet. a simple, simple question, but you know, that's what sometimes viewers want to hear. So, um, <laughs> what do you think about? Uh, well, I give it a C. A C is average mm -hmm. um, on a bell curve. Is is average good enough? Average compared to what? Uh, schools tend to be a reflection of their community. They tend to be a reflection, for better or worse, of the socioeconomic level and the educational level of the kids and the parents. Uh, and but we want them to be something more than that. We want them to add more value to the student than he, than he normally would have. We want them to be accountable to the parents, but also to the school boards as well. We find too often they're when you have local elected boards, they can't make the decisions or spend the money where they want because they're being told to by Sacramento through the categoricals. All the categoricals have important constituencies and they all have an important purpose, but should the decision making be there or among the about 1,000 locally elected school boards? Well, there's another issue uh, kind of uh, top down maybe, and that's uh, student testing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a key strategy in improving California schools. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's too much, too little, or it's just right? Well, I think there's a lot of it, and maybe there's too, mu too much. Uh, you need one test per year, one good test. You're testing on English and math, and if you can compare those scores year by year, you can see if the t student is getting better or not. Uh, you get them to the high school level, that's tougher because kids don't always have the same classes, but at least in the elementary level, uh, you, can, you can track those scores and also see if the teacher is helping them do better or if the teacher is simply if they're simply making progress, they would have made any any other way. So value added by teachers is important, and we find that some of the best teachers are not teaching in the school, schools with the highest APIs, but they're the ones that are actually adding more value to the kids. And we're going to get to that. And in those a kids would be improving anyway. When we talk about performance appraisals, but I do mm -hmm. want to ask you, what do you think about testing? Too much, too little, or just right? I think we have too much testing, and I think we have too much of the wrong kind of testing and not enough of the right kind of testing. And what I mean by that is, I think we need more assessments for. Uh, that inform instruction to help really find out where children are and we need um, uh, portfolio testing and really testing what kids are doing in school and, and, and evaluating the depth and breadth of what they're learning in school rather than focus on, on one simple test. We've only got a couple of minutes in this segment left. I'm going to get three questions in if I can and yeah. that is one of them is uh, focus on teachers and evaluation and pay. Uh, a lot of ed efforts are focused in that direction. What are your thoughts on that? Should there be a change in the way teachers are evaluated and paid? And one thing we talked about was value added. Mm -hmm, right. um, what do you think? Well, I think you know a lot of this discussion is about getting the bad teachers out of the classroom. I think what we really need to focus on is how we're keeping our good teachers in school, and that's about supporting teachers, making sure they have the tools necessary to do the job um, that they should be doing. 
Well, okay, let's talk about tenure for a second. Um, a lot of people complain it's impossible to fire teachers because of tenure. Uh, do you think tenure should be eliminated or, or changed Well, in some it's way? very difficult to do so. I think you might need a longer probationary period. You might need uh, and California to, to just look said at these it, teachers the probationary, more realistically. Excuse me, the, the probationary period right now is about two years, mm, right, and there right. are 10 states, I believe, right. that have that period, which is rather short. But teachers can also learn from each other. Uh, Julie's absolutely right. It's not just a matter of weeding out the ineffective teachers, but having those teachers in the middle learn from the better teachers. When I was teaching 18 years in public schools, so much time on paperwork, so much time on administrative uh, in-services, some state-mandated in-services, which were completely useless, and not enough time from us sharing ideas with each other, which is what we really need. Those are some of our most effective in-services. And so if you compare the stronger ones with those still learning, they can learn a lot. We've only got about 20 seconds left in this mm -hmm. segment, so and it's uh, a relatively big question, um, but I'll question. ask it quickly. Um, but another question mm -hmm. on charter schools and vouchers. Mm -hmm. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that briefly? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm for high-performing schools, um, and charter schools, I'm, if they're high-performing, I'm all for them. If it's a traditional school, I'm all for it. Vouchers, absolutely not. We do not want to pri privatize our public education system. Uh, it's a foundation and fundamental, I think, to our democracy. No. What, do, what do you feel about vouchers? I think they're fine. We have vouchers at higher education level. We have Pell Grants, other federal grants. You can take those to a private school, religious school, public school, uh, and if we had them at the local level, uh, I think you'd have a, a better, more responsive system. Many countries in the world have those systems, and I, I think it's time to look at them. Well, there's a clear distinction, but thank you very much. <laughs> when we come back, we'll talk about removing the roadblocks to improving K-12 education in California. This is the Matty Report. So let's talk about school funding. Um, let's talk about it generally. Do you think California funds K-12 through education at an appropriate level? No. We're sorely underfunded. Um, we are further away than any other state in this country in terms of adequate school funding. What do you think about school funding well, in California? Only half the money goes to the classroom. A lot of it goes to administrative overhead. A lot of it goes for expenses which we could cut back on if school districts are allowed more flexibility as to how to administer services. Uh, at the same time, I, I think that there are, is, our fund, is funding there that should go to schools. I was the only one in my party to vote to abolish redevelopment agencies when it first came before us because there was $1.7 billion that the governor needed to fully fund education rather than put it into corporate welfare, uh, in my view. Uh, this doesn't all, all have to come from the state, however. Seventy percent of all school bonds at the local level do pass. People will vote for tax increases locally if and they those, think they're going to see something for money. those have to be passed by two-thirds? I think it's 55% now, isn't it? They well, for that? bonds, it's a lower threshold. Right. For right. Uh, operating dollars, it's still a two-thirds right. two right. Operations is tougher because it's harder to, for people to justify this going into an operation whole. And they think they're getting classrooms or gyms or a new auditorium. It's an easier sell. They want to see something for their money. All right. Yeah, let me ask you about the initiative process. Uh, you got Prop 13, Prop 98. What is your assessment on their impact on education? Do you think it's helped education or hurt education? Well, it's taken the decision making more into Sacramento rather than locally is what it's done. Now, you can say it's helped or hurt, but uh, it wasn't so much Prop 13. It was the legislature's response to it to take all this power into Sacramento rather than it remain locally. Uh, and so a lot of power, well, power is centralized. The power follows and the money. It does, yes, it does. Right. What, what are your thoughts on the propositions and their impact? Well, I, th I think since Prop 13, the impacts on our schools have been devastating, and we're getting less. It requires, as Mr. Norby said, more money from the state coffers to uh, fund education. Um, and we have to compete with all the other uh, programs as well. And I think with Prop 98, for example, Certainly, I think with Prop 98, it's more a measurement um, of the ceiling as opposed to the floor, and that's what it was supposed to, to be, to guarantee a minimum amount of funding, not the maximum amount, and that's what it has turned out to be. You know, I also want to talk about, because you know, the money issue is so huge, the categorical issue. You mm -hmm. had mentioned that earlier a little bit. Um, what do you think about that? What do you think about school districts being given more discretion? That a good idea? Very good idea. Uh, Every district can't be all things to all kids. But is there Districts a can specialize, and if you don't think your kid is getting the right education, parents are generally in a position to make an inter-district transfer. But categoricals came about because somebody thought that there was a need for something. Right. Is there a concern if you give the money to the school district, then 
those things that are worthwhile programs may not no, happen? No, because they're closer to their constituents. They're closer to their parents. Well, and what I think, think from a state level, I, I would s support that notion that we should give more flexibility to the school districts, but certainly we've got to look at some of the accountability issues that we would want to measure how schools are doing from, from the state's perspective. But so accountability is a big issue yeah. with that. I, I have mm -hmm. been someone who has advocated for school finance reform for a very, very long time, and I believe that schools to, need to have greater flexibility, much more transparency in the system, and we need to have a weighted sense of funding towards well, the children of poverty and thank English language segue, learners. I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, the governor's proposal to change uh, the funding formula to this weighted student formula, basic a lot, basically allotting more money per pupil for students with greater needs. Oh, you're pretty much a fan, it sounds like. Well, I believe in the concept. I think some of the governor's proposals on this are flawed um, because, quite frankly, in his proposal, there is no guarantee where some of the targeted money goes to relative to English language learners in poverty. So, so some of the current categoricals now that are guaranteed funding sources to those community of students, in his proposal, school districts would have the complete flexibility not to spend those dollars for those students. What do you think of this weighted student formula idea? I think the problem with it is that school districts will then have a, an incentive to keep kids in these programs categorized this way because they get extra money. 85% of all kids in ELL judged limited English speaking are actually born in this country. I think they're over categorized in kindergarten. 85% are born 80, in this 85 country. 85%. Most of the kids in school speak English. They speak it well. I've been to schools in my district where like 75% are classified ELL. I go on the playground, I talk to them all in perfectly good English. Maybe they're not speaking academic English, but how many kindergartners are when they're first they're evaluated? Well, you want extra money to ad ad adjust social challenges, but you don't want that money to be an incentive not to solve them. Okay, well, I, we've only got about 40 seconds or so left in the segment. I want to ask you about the propositions. Um, you've got one being promoted by the governor and the California Teachers Association. You've got another being backed by the PTA. You've got another being backed by the California uh, uh, Federation of Teachers. What are your thoughts on those proposals? Well, there's certain, we need a solution in terms of revenue for education. There are three proposals out there. I agree with what they're trying to accomplish. Um, I, I hope at the end of the day there's one uh, proposal on the ballot so voters aren't confused and we can move forward uh, with a funding source for education. Clear in the field. Um, briefly, only about five seconds, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it would be good to have just a few rather than a whole host of competing ones and also have those tied to real accountability so the voters feel that they've got some control over where the money's going. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much, both thank of you, you, for being here. Um, when we come back, we'll talk about the politics of education. That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. Welcome back. Kevin Yamamura covers state politics for the Sacramento Bee, and he's our guest today. Uh, welcome to the Maddie Report. Thanks for having me. Um, can you give our viewers an overview on the K through 12 budget politics and how it's impacting local districts? Well, K-12 uh, comprises so much of the state budget. It's almost 40%. Uh, so whenever you're crafting a budget here in Sacramento, the first thing you have to consider is how much are schools owed? There's a constitutional requirement that mandates how much schools Prop get. Prop 98. Prop 98. Oh, by the way, when you say 40% of the, of the budget, is that the biggest part of the, of the state budget? It is. You know, a lot of people think prisons are, but it's not. It's it's. it's oh yeah, and that's a that's a misconception. Yeah. Okay. So so what happens with the budget politics here? You know, in the capital. So basically, uh, you have to consider how Prop 98, which tells you how much schools get, plays into uh, the budget that year, and it's based on a number of factors. You determine how much money you have to spend, uh, how much revenues are coming in through taxes, um, what was spent last year, and and what kind of growth there has been in enrollment and cost of living and. And, uh, and so you consider all of these things and you, there's a complicated formula and you determine what schools are owed and you have to sort of determine that first. But isn't that formula so complicated nobody really knows how it works? I mean, I've heard <laughs> that just a few people actually know how this formula Here's works. A, yeah, there's a joke that only maybe a few people, including one person who wrote it and has sent his kids to college based on his uh, singular knowledge of how it works. But yeah, it, it's a very complicated formula. But you have to determine how it, how it determines uh, the school funding school funding level first because, that, as we said, that's the largest part of the budget. And so once you figure that out, uh, then you also can figure out how to try to balance the other parts of the budget. Um, so, uh, so a lot of the school interests have a very powerful role in the budget process. You know, I was going to ask you, who holds the cards um, in education budget negotiations? 
and decisions. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the teachers union is, is uh, very powerful in the state, um, and uh, they are often involved in budget discussions from the get-go. Even before the governor releases his budget, they are told what the governor's thinking. Um, they are asked for their thoughts um, on where to go. Uh, just because there's this formula doesn't mean that the, the level of funding has to abide by it. Um, in, a, in a really tough year, tough years like we've had recently, uh, they have had to go below uh, what some people think is the, the required level for school funding. But they often do so. In order to do so, they, they get uh, sign off from the Education Coalition. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. How can there be cuts in education funding when there's supposed to be this constitutional guarantee through Prop 98 of a certain level of funding? Yeah. Uh, uh, in these in these years like we've been having since the recession where revenues uh, went the general fund revenues went from around a hundred billion and all, all the way down to 80 85 billion dollars uh, you know you the the constitutional guarantee may say one thing but if you stuck by it you would have to uh, you would have to give such a large share of, of that money uh, more than 40 percent maybe 50 percent or higher uh, to schools to in order to uh, to meet your obligation. Well, what, what happens to that money that we promised them but didn't deliver? I mean, I think they're referred to as deferrals. There, there are deferrals. That's one way of doing it, just saying basically. So we're going to pay we'll, you later. We'll pay you later. Uh, you, can, you can go out and spend it in this year, but we'll pay you maybe a few months after is the that, year ends. Is there interest on that, by the way? Uh, districts sometimes have to go out and borrow on, on the open but market. But the state doesn't pay them interest for not No, it's them. basically asking the districts to borrow. There, there are also, it, within Prop 98, if you don't pay the amount that, that the Constitution says you have to pay, there's uh, something called the maintenance factor, uh, which basically says, uh, keeps track of how much you've uh, shortchanged schools over the years, and then says that over time, you need to get back up to that level. You know, all this education funding, I'm, I'm sure it makes people a little dizzy. Sometimes it makes me dizzy trying yeah. to figure it all out. But, you know, there is a, this talk about we need more money for education, at least some people think so. There are a number of propositions that are be coming up on the November ballot, looks like. Um, and Governor Brown saying if his particular proposal doesn't pass, uh, the school years are maybe going to have to be cut by up to as much as three weeks. Is that a real threat? Well, I, I think it's difficult to see where districts would cut by three weeks more. Um, what that is, is he, he said that uh, it would be the equivalent to three weeks. Uh, uh, it, it, it's hard to see first how they could cut that far. I mean, that would by far make California the shortest school year in, in the country. Um, and we've already cut five days. Um, we've allowed districts to cut five days. These, these decisions are made, I should say, these decisions are made on the local level by districts depending on how they, uh, their financial situation. It used to be that, that every school district had, what, 180 days? And now some, I think I read a third of the districts now have something less than 180 days. Yeah, the, as, to deal with this budget crisis, uh, the state has allowed districts to go down to 175 days, so a week. Um, how districts save money is basically by furloughing teachers for that amount of time. Wow. Okay, when we come back, we'll talk about some competing education initiatives that are likely to find their way on the November ballot. This is the Maddie Report. November ballot is likely to be crowded. A big focus is going to be on education. So there are three tax proposals being floated for the November ballot uh, to support education. Yet each of the key education groups, like the California Teachers Association, the California Federation of Teachers, two different unions, and the PTA are supporting different proposals. Why can't they all get behind one proposal? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting situation, as you said. Uh, they each think that theirs is the best. They each think that theirs um, has either the best chance at the ballot or provides education uh, in schools uh, the best form of funding. Um, so what we have right now is y you have the governor's proposal backed by CTA and backed by uh, SEIU, which represents a lot of government workers. It's sort of the, the central, pro uh, central proposal from backed by, also backed by lawmakers. And so that proposal basically increases taxes for those making over 250000 It's got a five-year sunset provision. Also has a sales tax yes. component. Yes. Okay. Um, and then you have the uh, CFT plan, which they're dubbing the millionaire's tax because it focuses the income tax hike 
uh, only on those making at least one million dollars. And I'm guessing that's the most popular. It, it has been polling the best. Yes, of uh, course, it tax someone else. Yes. And then there's the third proposal backed by PTA, but financed by a uh, wealthy uh, civil rights attorney, Molly Munger, uh, daughter of Charles Munger, who works with Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. um, and her plan would tax almost everybody. Um, oh, I'm sure that's very popular. All but the very poor. Yeah, with, with income tax uh, starting at about $7,000 for a single filer. So that one has, as you said, is uh, the, is least the least popular, popular. In, in a recent field poll that came out last month. Okay, so if, let's say the governor, well, can the governor clear the field here? Or is this going to be a, kind of a circular firing squad? Well, he's trying hard. Uh, I, I think that proposal that we just, the last one I mentioned, the uh, one backed by Molly Munger and PTA, I mean, they seem very determined. Uh, Molly Munger has a lot of money that she can spend, uh, and, and in, in this game, in this uh, uh, environment, money talks. Um, if you have enough money, you can get enough signatures, you can go and buy advertising on television stations. Um, and then the governor is not, is not indicating he's going to back away. I mean, he's built his proposal into his budget plan. He's built a, a coalition of support um, from various sectors, so he, he thinks that everybody else should get out of the way. It seems like the one that he'd want to really get out of the way is the uh, California Federation of Teachers Millionaires Tax. And, and that one, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he has been working hard to, to try to talk everybody to, uh, out of the race. And so you're right. I mean, that one does pull the best. Um, he is very concerned about it. Um, I don't know whether he, he can get them to step down. Their problem may be financing. Um, but then again, you know, what they lack in financing, maybe they think they can make up in, in this very uh, strong poll numbers. Yeah, they, I was reading some polls that said that if all three end up on the ballot, no one gets a majority, none of them get a majority. So people just look at all of them and say, just say, vote no to everything. Yeah, that's the, the conventional wisdom around here. Uh, and it's been tested in various ways. I've seen a few different ways uh, uh, from having people, you know, a couple thousand people go online and read through the summaries of each of the taxes um, to calling people and reading them over the phone and saying, well, if you had all three of these, how would you vote? Um, those kinds of tests suggest right now that uh, the, the, the different tax measures would all suffer. I don't know if it means that they would all fail, um, but it's certainly making everybody nervous, uh, particularly in the governor's camp. Well, the Republicans are saying, listen, tax revenues are going up, economy's getting better, we don't need any of these. Um, what do the revenue estimates show? Well, uh, as the economy recovers, it's true that uh, tax revenues should follow along. So uh, uh, the, the nonpartisan legislative analyst office has done projections, as has the Department of Finance, and they, they do show that revenues over time, over the next several years, are going to grow. Um, but didn't the LAO also say that the governor's proposal isn't going to bring in as much money as he thinks it's going to bring in? Yes, that's true. Uh, the governor, or the legislative analyst, and the governor's department of finance are uh, kind of in disagreement uh, about one particular component of uh, the tax, which is that um, raising taxes on, on wealthy people. And that has always been the most volatile source of income for the state. We've only got about uh, 30 seconds or so left in this segment. I want to ask you, though, a question about um, uh, earmarks to, uh, to education, um, specifically, and how it affects the state budget. You know, if all this money is going to education, it's really not addressing the yawning state budget deficit. And if they do say, well, we, these propositions pass, so there's more money for education, we'll find another way to somehow take the money away from education. So basically, uh, robbing uh, Peter to pay Paul, how can we substantially increase funding to education and close the general fund deficit at the same time? That's, I mean, it's is that a great the, question. I mean, it's one that the governor is grappling with. I mean, that, that's why well, the governor- you got 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the go that's why the governor thinks he, his plan is the best is because it, it helps solve the rest of the budget. The other proposals uh, would require some more uh, maneuvering to do so. So it's a big challenge. It's one of the reasons that it's been so difficult to deal with the state budget. Well, I want to thank you very much uh, for being here. Kevin Yakamar from the uh, Sacramento Bee. Also, Assembly members Julia Brownlee and Chris Norby, uh, thank them for joining us. If you want to stay up to date with politics and policy, you can sign up for a daily a newsletter, the Maddie Daily, by logging on to our website at maddieinstitute.org. And now, thoughts from the editor. This week's featured editorial board writer is Michael Tharp of the Merced Sun Star. California, the politics of K-12 education. Thanks a lot, Andrea of Valley PBS, for such a simple subject. Easy to solve as world peace. Easy to understand as Sudoku. 
So I went to ground zero, teachers and administrators in Merced. I asked them to name the three most pressing problems in K through 12 education and their most practical solutions. Here's what they said. Sounded like the old ABBA song, a district administrator said, money, money, money. A high school teacher said, number one is not holding kids responsible in lower grades. In high school, they can't read, write, or think. Number two, we test our kids to death. How to take tests, a curriculum based on tests. There's no old fashioned education for the basics. Rhetoric, logic, literature. Number three, pushing more and more electives out the door. Solutions, one and two would help remedy number three. So we'd get educated people instead of numbers. We don't care about the children, it's about numbers and money. Here's another high school teacher. Number one, communication. When it's good, it works smoothly. Parents, kids, and teachers buy in. But when there's no clear message, we need more face-to-face -face contact. Number two, everybody celebrates API scores, but our kids are not ready to run the world. We celebrate filling in A, B, or C on multiple choice tests, but we don't celebrate the kids who have all kinds of learning. When they apply to Apple or Google or Microsoft, they're not ready. Number three, parents. The bridge between the school and parents needs to be stronger. If the parents are involved, it positively affects the kids. It takes a village, but where's the rest of the village? And a third high school teacher. Number one, as an educator, I can't help but wonder why schools have English learner classes under 20 while the average student languishes in 40 plus classes. Number two, how much of our curriculum is tainted by the likes of textbook lobbyists? And number three, what will the net result be with a high percentage of electives no longer being offered? In Japan, where I lived for 11 years, education is one of the most important values. The word sensei, or teacher, is made up of two idea graphs. One means prior or advance, the other means to live or a life. Together they mean a life advancement or a predecessor of life. When we Californians start respecting education as a virtue and sensei as a noble calling, the politics will take care of themselves. This is Mike Tharp, executive editor of the Merced Sun Star for the Matty Report. The views expressed in the Matty Report are those of the individuals participating in the program and do not necessarily reflect those of Valley PBS, KC, or the Matty Institute board, management, or staff. If you'd like to share your thoughts about the points and opinions expressed in the Matty Report, visit our website at valleypbs.org slash Matty. The Matty Report is brought to you through a production partnership with KC24 and Valley PBS, proudly working together with the Matty Institute to provide San Joaquin Valley with valuable analysis and insight about public policy issues. This has been the Matty Report. Thanks for joining us.